Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel The Israeli. Um, first of all I would like to thank everybody who subscribed to the channel and watched the videos. Also thank you for commenting and if you like the content please share it with anybody who, th who you think might be interested. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the two-state solution. Um, does it have a future? Is it dead? Um, why has it not been implemented yet? What are the problems that has been in the way of implementing it? And what are the other options? Are there other options? And, and where are we heading to? Okay, so we're going to go a little bit over the history and points of the two-state resolution. And we're going to use Wikipedia to do that. Wikipedia is good enough for us. And we'll get to this soon. So, the two-state solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict envisions the independent pa state of Palestine alongside the state of Israel, with uh, west of the Jordan River. The boundary between the two states is still subject to dispute and negotiations. Um, the Palestinians and Arabs leadership insist on the 1967 borders, which is not accepted by Israel. Today, the conversation is quite different, um, but we'll get to that soon. Um, and of course, Jerusalem, which is a big part of the problem. Um, okay, so let's start with where this thing started in. So this is 1917, when right after the British took over um, Palestine, Israel. And as you can see here, the country was one country under the British rule. And you can see over here Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, and Gaza. Gaza is a very ancient port. Jerusalem, as you know, is an ancient city. And Tel Aviv was formed in 1909. Um, and they're all there. And from the stories that I've heard, um, Jews and, and Muslims and Arabs lived fairly in coexistence, even though there were some really serious um, clashes between them, um, quite violent, um, that, 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 that still left its marks on both societies until, up until today. Um, okay, so this is in 1947. The next picture here is in 1947. And this is the partition plan that the UN offered to the Arabs and to the Jews. So in black, you can see the land that was offered to the Arabs, with Jerusalem being an international zone. doesn't belong to anybody. And the yellow, orange, um, to the Jews, to be the, Ju the future Jewish state. So the Jews accepted the offer, and the Arabs rejected it. And the Jews, in 1948, um, declared the independence of the state of Israel and were attacked by five armies and the new Israeli state won and conquered the rest of the territory. As you can see here, the territories that were once in black are now in orange, and the areas that were left in black, that was where the war ended in 1948. And these lines here that you see are called the 1967 borders. Yeah? Um, now, they're called the 1967 borders because there's a picture missing here, um, in 1967, there was the Six-Day War, and of course, as you know, after that war, Israel won, and it took over the rest of the territories in 1967. Now, they call this line here the 1967 um, Green Line because this is where the border was before the 1967 war, and that's the border they want to go back to in the peace agreement, how it was here. This is what they want to go to. They, they, more or less, they say territory-wise, we agree to this now. Okay, it it, so, it looks very simple when we look at it this way, but we'll get to 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 the small points and we'll see where the big problems actually lie. Okay, so let's go over a little bit of the history of the peace process. So we had in 1978 the Camp David Accords, which more or less started um, this whole process. I think it was Carter, President Jimmy Carter, um, that was president back then, but I'm not sure, please correct me. And then in 1991, 
there was the Madrid conference, which more or less laid the, the land for the Oslo Accords. And then in 1993 to 1995 were the Oslo Accords, um, which was actually the closest that we ever got to, um, to having an agreement. But because on the Israeli side, um, there was Yitzhak Rabin, and he was very serious about making the deal. And he had support in Israel. He had also a very big, strong opposition as well, of course, but he had support. The problem is that on the other side, there was Yasser Arafat. And now I'm talking from the Israeli point of view. Um, Yasser Arafat um, was seen as a terrorist. He wasn't even really seen as a real Palestinian because he was brought in from Tunis, I think. Again, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, he was in Lebanon um, fighting Israel and then he was in, and he formed the PLO and then he was deported from Lebanon to Tunis, I think. And then he was brought back for this peace process. And many Israelis did not trust Yasser Arafat. And one of the main reasons were because his speeches in English said one thing and his speeches in Arabic said a totally different thing. But Israel was willing to give it a chance. Of course, as we all know, in 1995, Yitzhak Rabin was murdered by an Israeli terrorist. And more or less after Yitzhak Rabin was murdered, um, the whole process started to crumble. And the second intifada started in 1995, which, which left a big, big scar um, on Israel. And Israeli people lost more or less all hope in a future peace process after the second intifada and um, to reignite the peace process again was very very difficult anyway 1997 was the Hebron protocol where Bibi Netanyahu um, um, gave gave um, control over the over to, over, of Hebron over to the Palestinians and then there were a few more Shara Mashech and then Camp David summit in 2000 was an important summit because Ehud Barak, the Prime Minister of Israel back then, offered the Palestinians everything, like really everything, and Yasser Arafat did not accept it. And then there was the Clinton, Taba, um, the roadmap, um, I think that was George Bush, uh, yeah, um, and then more things and more things and more things and more things uh, during the Obama administration. And then, of course, with Trump, the deal of the century, which did not come to volition. So there were many attempts to do it, but, but there are many things that are standing in the way, and we'll go about the primary concerns. The, fi the final borders between Israel and Palestine. So as you can see here, it's the borders are more or less, we know what the borders are going to be. The main problem is that there are many Jewish set, um, settlements inside the black area, the Arab area. And Israel does not really want to <coughs> evict Jewish peoples from their homes again after they had done it in the Gaza Strip. It's not something that's very simple for a country to do to evict its own people from homes that they've been living in for a long, long time. Now, I know some of you will now say, what about Sheikh Jarish and what is going on over there? And if you watch my other videos, you will see that I am not a lawyer and I, I don't really know what is happening there as far as the law and international law. But in my opinion, Israel should not evict those families that have been living there for decades and they should come to some kind of an agreement with the original owners and the cor current tenants. And they should not make it a political issue and they should find a solution for it. But on a mass scale, Israel, especially the current government, and even if it will be a, a left-wing government that does want to evict um, Israelis from their homes, it will be very difficult for them to do that because there isn't there, there might be support for peace, but there is no support for eviction, evicting Jews from their homes. That's something you have to understand. Um, but we can also come to a solution to that because just like Israel has um, close to 2 million um, Arab Arabs living in Israel with equal rights, and we'll talk about that as well, 
um, there's no reason why Jews won't be able to live in future Palestine um, with equal rights as well over there. Um, that is something that can, can be worked out. So the final borders is something which I won't say is easy to come to an agreement, but we can come to an agreement about that. Palestinian political violence. So again, when we look at the conflict that's happening now between Israel and Gaza, um, we can see that in Gaza there is a terrorist organization, Hamas, and, and every once in a while there's a wave of violence with them. And as long as they stay there, it's going to continue, and there's really no option of talking peace with Hamas. But if you look at the West Bank, um, yes, there has have been a few incidences, because after all, in the West Bank, um, the Palestinians um, do sympathize with, with the Palestinians in Gaza. And there were some incidences, but overall, it's been fairly quiet, because in the West Bank, the the Palestinian Authority and Abu Mazen, they are making sure that everything stays quiet because they want to have a good life. They want to have a normal life. Now, I, I think that Israel can do a lot more in the West Bank to really make it an example of how we can live next to each other. But we, the current government doesn't really do that. Uh, but we, the current government does let them live their life and and there aren't so many soldiers in the West Bank, especially not like there used to be. And Abu Mazen is doing quite a good job of keeping the peace. And we can see now this escalation um, with Gaza that in the West Bank things are fairly quiet. And I hope they stay that way. So the political violence, Palest Palestinian political violence, is something that can change. When people have a good life, when they have a future, when they have hope, they, they usually don't turn to violence. When you take that hope away, when you take that future away, they'll turn to violence. And, and you can see that right now very clearly between, Ga between Gaza and the West Bank. So I'm an optimist, and I think that Palest Palestinian political violence is something that is temporary because of the situation. And when we'll enter serious peace talks, um, it will stop. And Abu Mazen, I think, is proving it. And Abu Mazen is not... Uh, he doesn't love Israel. He really doesn't. Uh, you just need to read a little bit about who he is. He's not a Zionist. <laughs> yeah? Um, he hates Israel or doesn't hate Israel. He doesn't like Israel, but he understands the situation and he wants a better life for his people. And he's showing that he's doing his best to, to do that. But he's a very old man and, and his time is about to run out and there's going to be elections soon. And the winner, and when those, these elections will happen, and they will happen because Abu Mazen is a very old man. I don't know exactly how old he is, but he's not young. Um, we'll have to see who wins those elections and, and hopefully it'll be somebody pragmatic that Israel can talk to. The next point is the very important one. Palestinian refugees is probably one of the main points um, that are problematic in this issue. Um, the Palestinians want in the peace agreement to have about one million people come back to Israel um, under the right of return. And Israel does not agree to that. And the Palestinians didn't sign, like like here in the Camp David Accords, yeah, in 2000, that was one of the things that, that the Palestinians said, we can't sign unless you agree to this. Uh, they want one million refugees to come back to Israel and to get Israeli citizenship. And Israel is a small country, and they cannot agree to that. Demographically, it'll be a big problem. And Israel does not agree to that, and the Palestinians insist on it, and this is one of the main points. But again, I think that under true negotiations with, with good intentions at heart, we can come to an agreement about that. Um, Israel would not accept uh, refugees, but we can come to some kind of settlements about the refugee problem. Security concerns, I think that once we really talk peace, the security concerns will be solved. The status of Jerusalem, that is a big, big um, issue. In my opinion, in the two-state resolution, going back to the option of making Jerusalem an international um, area, kind of its own little autonomy, um, can be a good solution. And Zionist political violence, so this is another point. On both sides, Israel and the Palestinians, most of the people 
are pragmatic and, and want peace and are for the two state resolution. Of course that now if you'll have a survey, you'll find that it's diminishing from year to year because if we don't have talks, if we don't acknowledge each other, if the media doesn't show the other side in a positive way, if we don't do anything to advance relationships, then, then the will to have peace deteriorates. It's natural. But we can start building that trust again. And, and, and overall, people want to live a normal life. And living a normal life means peace. But on both sides, the people who are not interested in peace are against the two-state resolution. And each side wants the same thing. On the Jewish side, uh, they want one state of Israel with minimum amount of Arabs in it. And on the other side, which is mostly Hamas today, they want one state for the Palestinians, the whole country for the Palestinians, with no Jews in it. Um, according to Hamas, if you watch my other video, you'll see their chart. Okay, so, but I think that at the end of the day, Israel is a sovereign country in, um, with, uh, that can control those extremists um, if it wants to. And the Palestinian Authority has already proven that it can not completely stop, but, but minimize like in a serious manner the effect of the extremists on its, on its side. Um, and then the rest of the things can be can be fixed, no problem. The Fatah-Hamas conflict, this is part of the elections now that are going to be, and of course what's going to happen in Gaza. As long as Hamas is in Gaza, um, this is going to be a big problem to solve this, um, this conflict, especially if we're talking about a two-state resolution. So Hamas will have to be taken care of one way or the other. I really hope that the Palestinian people will change their leadership on their own and choose somebody that has their interest in heart. And I also hope that on the Israeli side, we will change our leadership to somebody who reaches out to peace in a more authentic way. Um, okay, so let's go a little bit about the other options. Yeah. So there's a two-state solution. There is a three-state solution, uh, which means that it, there no, no Palestinian state, but Gaza returns to Egypt and the West Bank returns to Jordan. Um, and then there's the proposal of um, dual citizenship, which this is more or less the one-state solution, where everybody lives in one state. And I want to talk about that. And of course, there's the no-state solution, which is what Bibi Netanyahu is more or less offering now, which means that they get an autonomy. Yeah, they, they get to self-rule themselves, self-determination, all the stuff, but they don't get to have an army, for example, and they're not a country. So the Palestinians are not very excited about that idea, and I can more or less understand why. Um, but the dual citizenship is more or less the one-state solution, where everybody becomes a citizen of one state. And... Well, I've been against a one-state solution for a long time because demographic-wise, um, within very few years, the Palestinians will outnumber the Jews. And then, since it's a democratic country, the Jews will lose their dream, the Zionist dream of having a country for, for self-realization, self-determination in their own land and deciding their own future. And it will more or less kill that dream. Um, that's why I'm for the two-state solution. But since the two-state solution seems to be less attractive from year to year on both sides, and since, like I said in all the other videos, the Jewish people are not going to disappear from Israel and the Palestinians are not going to disappear from Palestine, and both people have to be taken into account, so I think maybe the one-state solution will be our only option in the end. And... I think there's also a way of doing it. So in the next video, I'm going to talk about the way I see the one state solution and how we can implement it. And just to give you a little promo, I think that the way to do it in a responsible way will be to have a republic. 
and but we'll talk about that because this video is getting a bit long and most of you guys don't watch this until the end so we'll talk about the one state option in another video thank you everybody for watching this especially those of you who watched until the end and um, again if you like this content please um subscribe like and um, share and comment and thank you for everything and have a great day so i'll see you next time bye